Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll start a couple minutes early for this webinar. Uh, hello, and welcome to the Biophilic Cities webinar series. I'm Amanda Beck. I'll be your moderator. I'm a graduate student in urban and environmental planning here at UVA, and I'm part of the Biophilic Cities project. Through this series, we will hear from practitioners and researchers who are working to bring abundant nature back into cities, to foster deeper connections with the natural world, and to make cities more natureful and richly biodiverse places. The Biophilic Cities Project started at UVA in 2011 to explore and advance nature in cities. And in the fall of 2013, the Global Biophilic Cities Network was launched with 10 project partner cities that are actively working to promote nature within their communities, as well as sharing successful tools, projects, and engagement. The webinar series is one of the many ways in which the new global Biophilic Cities Network will help to disseminate knowledge about the innovative work of cities, organizations, and individuals around the world. This series will consist of eight presentations once a week until mid-November. To see the full schedule of topics and to register for one or more of these upcoming webinar presentations, please visit our website at www.biophiliccities.org slash webinar dash series. Next week, we will be hearing from Alexandra Ramson, Director of Sustainability at the Seattle firm Rushing, and Jennifer Barnes of 555 Consulting, both of whom are active members of the Biomimicry Puget Sound Network. Ramson and Barnes will speak about Urban Greenprint, a project run through Biomimicry Puget Sound that focuses on how cities can restore urban, ecology, urban ecological health by learning from nature. Today, we will be hearing from Matt Berlin, the Environmental Program Coordinator for Portland, Oregon's Environmental Services Agency. Within Portland's watershed, the agency is responsible for operating and maintaining the sewer and stormwater systems. Berlin heads up community outreach and education to build awareness of work such as the Gray to Green Initiative and the Tabor to the River Program. Berlin holds a BS in Environmental Resource Management from Virginia Tech and a Master's of Urban and Regional Planning from Portland State University. Uh, Matt Berlin will speak for 30 minutes today to be followed by questions from the audience. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Matt. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. You all ready there, Matt? Yeah, I'm just checking. Can you hear me on the other end there? In there? Just checking if you guys can hear me there. Okay, I got you. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm going to start here and uh, apologize for the adjustment there. Um, my name is Matt Berlin. I'm uh, the Environmental Program Coordinator, um, as Amanda indicated, uh, with the Willamette Watershed Team at the City of Portland Environmental Services. Um, I'm reading the comments there, so if it does look like I can be louder, I'll try to turn it up. Um, so uh, we're excited to be part of this webinar series. Uh, I am. Uh, I was fortunate uh, to attend the uh, Biophilic Cities launch last year uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I gave a broad overwork of what the City of Portland is doing to boost and support nature in our uh, in our city. Um, Dr. Beatley asked that I talk today a bit more in depth about one of our green infrastructure programs, uh, the Tabor to the River program, and uh, I'm going to do that um, over the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, I work at Environmental Services, which is a government bureau at the City of Portland. It's a local bureau. Um, and we operate and maintain the city's storm and sewer system to protect public health, water quality, and natural resources. Um, and today, I'm going to talk about how green infrastructure has kind of evolved and how our bureau does work. 
And I'm going to do that through an overview of the Tabor to the River program, which is a large scale, multifaceted project that capitalizes on the multiple benefits provided by green infrastructure. Um, and I should say I represent a large team of experts that care a great deal about this work. Um, I'm one of a very large team. And um, folks have worked uh, very hard to advance these efforts over the last several years. So I'm representing that group of people. Um, and so I'm going to advance this slide. I do want to uh, say that if there's a time lag issue, it's going to take me a few minutes to adapt. So let's see if it works here. Okay, there we go. So that's uh, the introduction there. Sorry about that. So for anyone that's not familiar with Portland, uh, it's in the northwest corner of the United States, um, just under Washington, just above California. And we're at the confluence of two major rivers, the Columbia River and the Willamette River, um, which means there's a lot of activity and a lot of connectivity in this area. Um, particularly in relation to endangered species, um, many salmon species. Uh, and so that, of course, affects our work as the Sewer and Storm and Watershed Bureau. Our city is about 145 square miles. From a stormwater perspective, uh, that's about 45 square miles of impervious area through our rooftops, our streets, and our parking lots. Okay. So from that perspective, we're looking at a lot of stormwater runoff. And as we have looked in the past at our city and how it's developed, that's become a very prominent issue in terms of water quality and the health of our river. So I just wanted to kind of include this slide here. It's a slide of uh, where our buildings are in the city, and the red lines indicate the historic streams um, that were uh, within um, this watershed before we developed here. Um, it's looking like my pictures might have jumped on the screen there, but um, what I wanted to indicate here was that there's a natural history when it comes to hydrology in, in cities, and of course, that lays the foundation for how we're looking at how to manage these areas. Um, these streams uh, once flowed through the east side of the of the um, sorry of the city of Portland, and as we developed here, naturally we had to manage um, our sewer and storm the best way that we could. So you know, in cities that developed, um, a lot of times surface water went into um, the streamways, and in that upper right, you can see one of our sloughs that's no longer there. It's been developed over. And as more and more development came and, and conveyance became more important, um, the bottom right photo there is a picture of building one of the, uh, the brick sewer systems. Um, they naturally would try to uh, position these sewer systems around the natural drainage ways. And so when we look at some of where our pipe systems go, a lot of them are very similar to where our natural hydrology um, once laid. So of course, looking at the increase in surface runoff, um, we deal with uh, the problems that most of these deal with, water pollution, flooding, uh, stream bank erosion. Uh, we have a combined sewer like many other sewers, so we are struggling with combined sewer overflows, and in some cases, um, capacity problems on the other end of the pipe with basement sewer backups. Most uh, Portland residents know, um, and many outside of Portland may as well, that we've used very common solutions to these problems. Um, pipes, the gray approach. Uh, the big pipe has been a project um, since two, uh, 1994, and it ended in 2011. Uh, it was a $1.4 billion project to add capacity and reduce our combined sewer overflows into the Willamette River. So an expensive, long-term project. Um, to fix the combined sewer overflow problem. So over that time, we were also studying more innovative ways um, to incorporate green techniques to manage these urban challenges. 
Um, so we were using engineered systems, and I also want to point out using natural systems as well, and that use plants and soil to absorb stormwater where it falls and mimic a more natural hydrologic process. Anywhere from our eco roof program to our green street program uh, to our floodplain restoration program, added capacity in the floodplain to prevent flooding. So through the 2005 Watershed Management Plan, we identified four watershed goals to guide our work, and which took a much more holistic view of our natural and our engineered systems in the city. And we kind of we refer to this as the watershed approach. And green infrastructure plays a big role in connecting our storm and sewer and watershed systems together. So the adoption that happened was actually um, upon several steps. The, many of the green infrastructure projects that we work on in the city of Portland started with very small scale pilot projects, um, which were monitored and evaluated for performance over time. And working from there, adapting those strategies to the site level, the site scale, and the neighborhood scale, and the city scale. Um, and then from there, trying to garner support through promotion, outreach, and education, uh, building that into some of our city programs and projects, and then boosting implementation when we knew we could rely on that type of work. So that's a little bit of a background of, of how we've gotten to where we are today. I want to focus uh, the rest of the presentation on our Tabor to the River program. Uh, and how this program is an on-the-ground reality uh, that examine the impacts from integrating this green work into a storm sewer construction project. And I'll just refer back to our involvement with Biophilic Cities at this point. Um, we've been very fortunate to be involved for the last three years uh, connecting with Dr. Beatley and his great team at UVA um, and we've participated in the launch, and uh, their team has come to Portland a few times, and um, it's provided a great context for us to put our green infrastructure work into. Our bureau really focuses on this work as a stormwater uh, approach, and we do that to help manage our combined sewer, and in other areas, our separated sewer and our surface water conveys. Um, so to, to talk about it in terms of how to make a city more healthy for its population, uh, its residents, its fish and wildlife, and its natural resources um, allows us to look at this through a very different lens. Um, so I may refer to this within our language, our context of stormwater management, um, and, and hopefully you'll see how it applies to the larger dialogue. Uh, so the Tabor the River Basin, um, which is right in front of you here in this image, um, is about 2.3 square miles in size. It includes a great deal of residential, commercial, and some industrial uses. And it struggles with common problems um, from uh, areas that have been um, developed over the similar timeline as Portland. Uh, aging infrastructure, uh, aging pipes for sewer and storm, um, meaning that there are structurally deficient pipes needing repair. There are capacity issues causing the combined sewer overflows and basement sewer backups. And uh, we're responsible for operating and maintaining those systems. And going back to that historic stream here, just to orient you, this is the basin um, that we're talking about. This is the Tabor to the River Basin. And on the right side of the screen there, um, the the I guess the water bodies, you can see that is Mount Tabor. Uh, and the river, of course, is to the left. Um, this is just to get you a little oriented, but you can see how the basin itself um, encompasses where, at one point, a large stream existed on that side of the river. So the program mission uh, was to uh, come up with a solution for these challenging problems. Uh, and there were um, a couple of options. In 2000, we did a pre-design to look at an all-gray approach to fixing these problems. 
And in 2006, we did another pre-design that incorporated green infrastructure elements into that work. Um, and we chose the second option, which integrated watershed approach, the watershed approach, into a system capacity and pipe rehab project. And we were wanting to implement solutions to address multiple objectives of watershed health, including water, water quality and hydrology, and sewer system improvements, and also, also boost healthy na native vegetation in the area. And then we also wanted to develop a replicable framework. And this is very important um, because this, is new, this was a new approach for us. So if we're able to learn from it and replicate it, um, we can produce uh, those multiple objectives. We can achieve those multiple objectives in other areas in the city. So a, a little overview of what, what it involves, and then we'll dig a little deeper. Um, the integrated approach includes, um, certainly includes uh, pipe rehabilitation, so repairing or replacing 81,000 feet of sewer pipe. Uh, but we also wanted to add in the green infrastructure elements, 500 to 600 sustainable stormwater facilities, uh, plant thousands of trees, remove invasive plants from some areas, and encourage community action on private property. Uh, there were some key messages as part of this work. Building social infrastructure is important to helping support green infrastructure. Social infrastructure like partnerships, connections, networks, um, with the community in the, uh, in the vicinity. Uh, spend time working with them as much as working with the engineers for the project. Looking at multiple goals for each project uh, or initiative that's part of the greater program. Uh, and that the time that we invest in educating the community and outreach to the community up front can save a lot of money and uh, potential headaches down the road. So I want to dig into a, each of the elements of this program, um, which I hope will convey the integrated approach as well as the elements that bring nature into this, into this program and into the way that uh, we're enhancing this area of the city here. And we can start with um, the gray side of it, the public works projects that, that are really um, the thing we need to do, the thing that we really need to do is fix these pipes. And of course there are some that are at a point of, of, of a state of disrepair that need replacing. Um, and in this area, 81,000 feet of sewer pipe or over 15 miles of sewer pipe um, will be replaced. Uh, that's 35 capital projects over 15 years. And what this will really address are some of the, uh, the hot button areas, sewer backup risk, pipe rehabilitation where the pipes are, are in that state of disrepair, and then to a greater effect, watershed health in the area. Green streets are a, a huge element of this program. Uh, stormwater facilities in the right of way that receive runoff from the street. Um, we have over 1,500 green streets in the city of Portland now, and five of, 500 of which are or will be installed in the Tabor to the River program area. Um, there are fantastic multiple benefits that come from green streets. Um, in addition to the stormwater management, we've integrated them into our transportation planning and our utility planning where if we're going to work in the right of way with a construction project, we're better aligned with other bureaus that could be doing work like that. Um, you can see on the left picture there that it's been built into a crosswalk uh, to make it safer and easier for pedestrians to cross the street. Um, the design capabilities um, are flexible enough that we can use them in areas of dense parking um, to, to uh, minimize the impacts on parking as well as um, areas where bicycle and pedestrian safety are particularly challenging. And uh, they're, they're quite a good reliable way of approaching and managing um, all of that stormwater volume that comes off the street. And here's another uh, more community-based example um, where we're, uh, we're a bit further off the right of way. And, and this definitely involves partnering and communicating a great deal. We'll get into that a little later, but 
communicating a great deal with our neighbors um, and working with them to make sure that these are integrated into what their vision is for their neighborhood. Um, in some cases, these facilities can be lined, and, some, and uh, in some cases, they'll act as flow-through facilities. Uh, and in most cases, in the Tabor area, um, they're infiltration uh, facilities, so they allow the water to work, their, work its way into the ground. The next program element I want to talk about um, is the vegetation and livability elements. Um, there are three aspects of the recommended plan through the Tabor the River program, um, and that involves uh, lots of street tree planting, uh, revegetation projects to bring native plants back into um, the watershed, and and also to work on community livability projects. So how can we make uh, how can we bring nature in and make the neighborhood and the community um, more livable, improve the livability. Um, and this time, uh, 61 acres of invasives, invasive species have been treated in the area, uh, and 32,900 native shrubs and trees have been planted. Um, I'm not sure if my animation is going to show up on here or not. No. Um, that nice picture on the right is the before photo, and what's under that um, is, a, uh, is an image of what it looked like after. Um, less invasive species. <laughs> so. In addition, um, as I mentioned, working with street trees uh, is a really great opportunity to connect with neighbors. Um, we work with partners um, in, our, in our community, particularly Friends of Trees, um, to install uh, on a large scale trees all over the city, and in particular we targeted uh, the Tabor of the River area for this. Um, we worked hard to connect with groups like um, our friends groups, our Friends of Mount Tabor Park volunteers contributed uh, 4,900 hours to invasive plant removal at Mount Tabor Park uh, and planted over 2,300 shrubs there. Um, so it's a big element of our work trying to get more vegetation, improve livability in the area, get those benefits um, communicated out to the public and work with our partners to get that work done. Uh, a very interesting element of the Tabor River program, the private property retrofit program. Um, and this was a great opportunity. Uh, a large proportion of the study area remains in private ownership. So an integral part of the project was to identify where private property opportunities exist to help meet our goals. Um, whether it's private property or public property, stormwater volume is stormwater volume. Um, and so it's important to be able to bridge that gap. And this was one of the first programs that was able to do that. Um, the city was able to provide and is able to provide substantial financial and technical assistance with project construction and the facilities um, with the facilities to remain on private property and be maintained by the property owner. Um, and so we're looking here at a before and after. The left side, this is a, a restaurant called Nuestra Cachina, uh, which is right in the middle of our study area. And the before and the after on the right side there um, with the stormwater facility, this I believe is managing the water from the roof. And another example, um, Western Seminary, which is at the other end of our study area, um, where you've got on the left, um, maybe a stormwater expert would look at that and say, oh, that's a missed opportunity. And so on the right, we were able to absorb that stormwater volume from that building and keep it on site and out of the pipe system. So we saw a great level of implementation through this program. Um, there were uh, program assessments in the field where they identified um, four plus acres of existing uh, stormwater controls that we didn't know about, so we were including that in the model. Um, to get a better understanding of where we needed our improvements. And in addition, uh, over three acres of new stormwater controls um, were installed over, um, over 64 constructed projects. Um, so an incredibly effective program um, when it comes to reducing um, volume of stormwater, and in this case, getting it off of private, of pro private property, or keeping it on private property and getting it into the ground. A 
a huge element of all of our work, and in, in this case, um, a big part of the Tabor of the River work um, is stewardship. Uh, so working with um, community members, community groups, and engaging them in our work. Um, one exciting program that we have um, is the Green Street Stewards Program that's seeking to engage community members in the management of Green Street facilities. So far we've had 260 Green Streets that have been adopted by 124 stewards citywide. There were 53 facilities that were adopted in the Tabor area. Our programs provide technical assistance, guidance, um, and resources to help uh, individuals and groups build a relationship with these facilities and, and invest some time and energy in um, becoming part of, part of the process. Uh, it's been really, really successful. Um, another uh, really great program is the uh, Community Watershed Stewardship Program which provides uh, small grants to do uh, community-based watershed projects um, where we can actually engage community members with these functional stormwater facilities and build up, um, build up that relationship, build up that understanding of why those types of projects are important. Education and outreach is, is key to all of this, and um, it, it's important to talk about it, uh, you know, as, we've, as we're finishing such a large-scale project, or not finishing, but as we're getting to a point where we've established several years of that work. Um, we know that education is a key component, um, particularly of the green stormwater infrastructure projects. It's important to know who your audience is. Um, it's important to know that there are all kinds of, of styles of learning. Um, and so outreach methods can change. We've tried to incorporate bicycle tours, um, signage, newsletters, communication, um, as well as partnering with, you know, all the different com components of the community to try to facilitate a network and, um, and boost communication. Um, you know, it's really, this is essentially a new style of doing our work. And um, change is, is hard for some, for, for, for some groups. For some people, um, looking at new ways of doing things, um, it's not without skepticism. And so it's really important to explain and educate people. And what we've, I think, seen is that once we get a few successful projects in the ground, it's a little easier to accept them. Um, and it's really, it's really an important element. It's getting that in front of people on a regular basis. Some of the things we've learned through the outreach and education uh, process, definitely developing and fostering partnerships with neighborhoods, um, schools, businesses. Businesses are key. Um, a really great lesson that we learned was that providing education long before the construction begins is really important. Um, and you know, when you're looking at these pipe systems and green systems, um, construction is going to happen in either way, and it can either be digging up the pipes in your neighborhood and bringing in a, a huge disturbance, um, or we could integrate some of these green elements which might be easier and a, a little safer um, or a little easier to, um, a little less intrusive into a, a neighborhood environment. Um, we definitely offer technical assistance uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, we try to build up our outreach through partnerships with other um, common goal uh, organizations. Um, so we'll try to leverage some resources with groups that promote um, promote habitat and promote uh, you know, watershed work and, and native planting and rain gardens. We do a lot of work with some of our excellent partners in Portland here. Definitely plants and gardening um, will interest a lot of the community and, and educating them on the function of this, uh, of, of plants and gardening is really important. There are a lot of ways to overlap those interests. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, pilot projects um, when we, when we install the pilot projects and we try to monitor them and understand them better, really using that opportunity to promote and highlight their function and appeal. Partnerships have been key. Uh, I, you know, I really uh, can't emphasize this enough. We work with over uh, 20 partners um, across the board um, from, from all different walks, including city programs, city bureaus, um, there's a lot of ways to um, build relationships around this work. Um, I would say that we're very lucky to have a partnership with the Biophilic Cities Project for the same reason. 
Um, it's not as much on a local level, but it does allow us to talk about this work in a different context. Um, partnerships allow it to be mutually beneficial and cost effective. Um, we've had community leaders that have installed projects in our study area that have um, built a relationship with a business down the street who then builds their project and then they communicate to folks across the street. It starts to, it starts to work its way through the neighborhood. Um, we know that the projects work. Partnerships allow us to communicate their functionality and build upon that. And we do a lot of types of shared events and cross-marketing uh, with broader audiences to do that. So the key to, to all of this, though, is that when we've integrated the gray and the green infrastructure, when we look at the two approaches, the all gray approach and the integrated green and gray approach, we were able to save a total of $63 million for the rate payer. And I'll spend a couple more seconds on this slide because I think this is probably the most important slide. By integrating green infrastructure at a cost of $11 million to our greater program, we were able to save $63 million to the rate payer. And so what's the, what this is getting at is that by relying on uh, some of the relationships and some of the multiple benefits provided through green infrastructure, we're making our gray system and our gray pipes more resilient and allowing um, us to hold some of that water on site at a lower cost, um, which we relay directly to our rate payers. Um, this is an important aspect when it comes to looking at, in retrospect, the cost of our big pipe, which was one point. $4 billion and that we're still paying for, I think we're doing our due diligence to try to come up with innovative ways to save money. And this is uh, our best example so far of doing that on a large scale. What we'd like to do next, what we are doing next, is replicating that framework. So moving off of, this was another series of images, so you're just seeing the last image on this slide now. Um, but the, gray, the green area being Tabor the River, um, we've also moved to the orange area, which is our Hollywood district, and the pink area, which is our Alder Basin. And so, um, again, working on uh, an evolving scale, working from the small scale and then bringing it up to the basin scale, we're now able to replicate that in other areas. Well, of course, you know, we have plenty of things to learn and plenty of ways to improve. Um, but, of course, we'll be able to apply those lessons and keep on improving how we get this work done. And, of course, uh, I want to definitely mention that we want to incorporate this work into broader planning efforts. Um, our city is in the middle of updating its comprehensive plan and um, looking at a long-term planning process. Um, one element of that is our Healthy Connected Cities. Um, where we're looking at how to make um, transportation interests and movability and green infrastructure and healthy, healthy watersheds, um, bring all of those into the same fabric. Uh, and so looking at this um, across the city, trying to bring um, the idea of mobility closer towards uh, our interest of stormwater management and watershed health, um, that includes uh, populating some of these green connectors with green streets, making sure that there's good urban canopy in those areas, and looking at some of the multiple benefits and the symbiosis involved with um, those uh, multiple uses. And in addition, um, this again is the second image. There's another image below there, climate change and, um, and how uh, green infrastructure can help to sequester carbon um, and looking at that uh, as a way of approaching areas that might be beneficial um, when it comes to the urban heat island effect. Um, so looking at those benefits from our green infrastructure work and how we can uh, double up on the benefits provided. An example would be in an industrial area that has very little green space. We could really um, focus some of our efforts in those areas. Um, and then the image that you see here is our um, regional equity atlas, which was produced in the last couple of years by the Coalition for Livable Future. So in addition to looking at where we functionally need more uh, green infrastructure, we also want to look at where we socially need more green infrastructure. Where are the benefits provided? Are they being provided um, to 
all communities equally? Where can we focus some of our efforts to make sure that the health benefits, the biophilic benefits that come from these, these green programs are meeting the people that uh, most need them. I think that's my last slide. I want to say thanks. And I see that there's a few questions, and so I'll Hi. open it up for thank that. Thank you, Matt. And that was a really great presentation. It's thank you. always good to see the innovation in other cities to try and apply it to your own. Um, we do have some really great questions. So one of them, we'll just pick a little randomly. Uh, which good practices elsewhere inspired you and your work in Portland? Uh, that's a, OK, that's a great question. Um, so I'll, pro I'll say this once. I'll, I'll, otherwise, I'll probably say it over and over again. But um, I, you know, I represent um, a lot of folks that really were the ones that were inspired to bring this to Portland. Um, we've been very fortunate to have um, leadership over the last several years um, that are responsible for actually bringing this work here. And, and I can speak for them that um, certainly uh, in the green roof world, we learned a great deal from Europe. Um, we had a couple of folks um, in our local area who were just real pioneers that were willing to try things out. Um, and I think we can look at, at Europe, um, Germany, Austria um, as, as leaders that we, we learned a lot about that information. We, we learned that um, things that work there might not work here, so we might need to adapt um, our designs. And I think, um, you know, I think from the design community really, um, you know, thinking creatively about how to, how to operate and maintain a system where your inputs are all over the map. Um, being creative about how to integrate um, resources and considering stormwater a resource instead of a waste. Um, it's very expensive when stormwater is a waste. You have to convey it away from you and get it out of your system. But there are lots of ways that you don't have to treat it as a waste. You can treat it as a resource and keep it on site. Great. Okay. The building lawn improvement is a visual improvement, but the store looked more nature friendly before. How can such improvements be made softer? Building lawn improvement the store. Um, okay, I think I know which one we were talking about there. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm assuming it's this slide here. Well, it's okay. Um, I think in general, the question of um, how can these be made softer, I think that really comes down to site limitations. Um, I think it's a site-specific question. Uh, and I think particularly in those examples, we were dealing with a great deal of stormwater volume. That was our primary goal. And so a lot of times you'll see um, that be leading the form, I think, the function leading the form. In that case, um, and I believe she was referring to the second example um, that was also um, a bench that was provided as part of the design. So what they were trying to do was incorporate an area that would um, be interactive and people would use the bench um, you know, to, to sit on. It was a little bit of a public space. And while it might have looked more natural beforehand, I don't think it was used as a public space beforehand. And so um, we've seen that design um, happen from time to time where there are areas that kind of lack public space and there are ways to design facilities, um, again, for multiple purposes. So um, if you're able to incorporate a bench or an area where people can interact or signage, then you get more benefit. Great. Thanks for those answers. How about just a few more? Um, Who is responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of the green areas? What happens if and when utility needs to install or repair their infrastructure in location of the green space? Uh, again, a good, a good question, one that we get all the time. Um, and it's probably more complicated um, than I'll go into here. But you know, when it comes to uh, private property, um, we have kind of a maintenance agreement where we'll help maintain facilities and then the maintenance goes to the property owner. In some cases, it's the property owner's responsibility. Um, for example, with, with green roofs on a private property, um, we've provided an incentive 
um, for several years where the property owner was responsible for that maintenance. Uh, when it comes to green, green Street facilities, those are managing stormwater off the right of way, which means it's our responsibility. And either our group or our um, contractors that we hire will maintain those for a specified period of time. Um, the tricky part there is, 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 is going back to our education challenges and making sure that um, people understand the difference between a functional green street and an aesthetically pleasing green street. Um, there's a difference there and um, of course when it gets uh, put up against other costs, um, sometimes maintenance is the, uh, the, the one thing that gets reduced when um, it's in a budget. It's a challenge. It's definitely difficult. Um, we can't forget that pipes require maintenance too. So um, sometimes because they're underground, it seems that we don't have to maintain them. It's very expensive to maintain pipe systems. So when we talk about that, we're comparing, um, we're trying to compare apples to apples, which means we look at the maintenance and operating costs for both facilities and see where we can reduce, reduce costs. And finally, just the, the, the really popularity of the Green Street Stewards Program has helped us to kind of look at Green Street maintenance um, as an opportunity to build relationships with communities, um, and in some cases, organizations with lots of members that are excited to get out and do something that they can, they can see that has a visual impact. I think the last question was about what happens when there's a public utility um, that, that needs repair in those uh, facilities. I think it operates the same way. Um, if there's an emergent um, problem and it needs addressing, um, these are facilities, these are part of our infrastructure. We would, um, I imagine we would go in and try to fix the problem and then repair the facility. Hopefully that answers your question. Great, and could you also talk about uh, how new private development fits into the overall paper to the River Gold, uh, specifically this attendee mentioned Division Street and how it is rapidly urbanizing? Yeah, it's a big challenge. And I know the, the, the person asking the question understands the challenge. Um, and really anybody that's been on Division Street or is familiar with it knows that um, it is rapidly becoming a very different place. Um, in terms of new development, the city has a stormwater management manual that requires um, a certain level of compliance um, with managing their stormwater on site. Um, and so we already have kind of a precedent set for what we expect from new development in Portland. Um, in the case of uh, Division Street, I think what we're seeing is that um, they're able to do it in a way that doesn't really capitalize on the multiple benefits of storm water facilities um, and you know, I don't want to get into too much of the weeds but but for those that aren't familiar with the area we've got a very dense very tight corridor that's becoming um, um, more dense with more uh, resident more multifamily buildings um, and they're building out to a hundred percent of the lot and they're causing parking challenges and they're not they don't have very many opportunities to manage stormwater um, a lot of the stormwater professionals are looking at that as opportunities, great opportunities for green roofs because they're built out 100%, so you could really soak up that water. Um, and we just had a hard time getting the development, um, the developers of those buildings and um, the designers of those buildings um, to, to be willing to do those types of green roofs. Um, and so, they're able to still um, comply, but not in a way that we would like to see it done so that it's more um, woven into the fabric of that street. Great. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for doing this webinar. It was wonderful to hear from you. Um, I know several people were interested in being able to speak to their own city councils about similar projects they could start in your own community, do you have any advice or contact information if people would like to follow up questions with you? Sure. I'd be happy to provide um, my contact information. I think I should have provided that on the slide there. Um, but I can provide it. Uh, why don't I just spell it out now and then I'll see if there's a way to follow up after. Unless there's a, here, maybe I'll type it into the chat. You can also type it into the chat box. There you go. 
I will say that um, you know I think I think we've got some great examples to share with uh, with other city councils. Um, we are not we we have not been perfect in the process. There are plenty of things that we've learned. There are lots of things we still need to learn. Um, I think we've we've been very fortunate at a persistent um, and um, and consistent approach um, to try to evolve and innovate. Um, and I think a lot of the credit goes to um, our communities here and also to our progressive leadership um, that have supported this kind of work over the last um, few few years, a couple of decades. And looking at looking at more innovative tools in the box to come up with greater solutions that save money and provide multiple benefits. And so um, we may have some examples to help um, to help you with your city council or your elected officials um, to at least make the case. And um, you know, I invite you to come out. We'll be happy to take you um, on a tour and show you some of the examples of this work. Great. Well, thank you so much, Matt. I really enjoyed your webinar. Um, thank you, everyone. And Join us next week, Wednesday, at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to hear from Jennifer Barnes and Alexandra Ramson about the Urban Green Print Program through Biomimicry Puget Sound. And thank you, everyone, for attending, and enjoy the rest of your day.